Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. I'm your host, Roberto Mazza, and today our guest is Reverend Thomas Hommel. He was chair of theology at Episcopal High School and an adjunct professor of church history at Virginia Theological Seminary, both in Alexandria, Virginia. He has been a senior fellow at the Christian Heritage Research Institute in Jerusalem since 1985 and has contributed multiple articles on Jerusalem to various publications. With his wife, Ruth, he has written a book, Patterns of the Sacred, English Protestant and Russian Orthodox Pilgrims in the 19th Century, published in 1995. Thomas, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Good to see you again, Roberto. Thank you. Now, there is only one question that I normally ask my guests, and the question is, what is your Jerusalem? In other words, what is your connection to the city? Well, it began in uh, 1969 when I was on an archaeological excavation in Jordan. Uh, And in that time, it was just after the Six Day War, and uh, in part of what we did while we were on the uh, excavation was to climb on Mount Nebo. And like Moses, I looked over from Mount Nebo and saw uh, the city of Jerusalem in the distance, but I wasn't able to go. So it wasn't until 1985 when my wife got a grant from uh, the Holocaust Survivor Network uh, to come and visit Uh, Jerusalem while she did a two-week study program. And it was in the few days we had before that began that I really got to first experience the city. And I loved it enough that I applied for a a grant from uh, the, what is it, the um, Fulbright Fellow. And uh, they uh, paid for me to come over to Jerusalem. And I spent that time exploring Jerusalem in a much deeper way and got to know people, uh, people both in the uh, educational institutions in Jewish Jerusalem, but also people and scholars uh, in the East Jerusalem community. And so that brought a whole new uh, way of exploring the city uh, and then I was invited to become a senior fellow of the Jerusalem, the Christian Heritage Research uh, Institute in Jerusalem. And uh, it is at that point that I began to come to Jerusalem uh, every year and participate in various conferences and um, other ways of exploring the city. So it's been a long uh, and very fruitful relationship with me or for me. Most of your work focuses on pilgrims and uh, pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So I was wondering if you can tell us, what does it mean to be a pilgrim? What is a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, particularly for Christians? Well, that's a good question. And there are so many books written about it. Uh, And I think I would want to contend that, uh, at least for Christians, there is a way of understanding the pilgrimage to Jerusalem that is somewhat unique. And that is that for Christians, I would uh, argue that it is a sacramental act. Um, It's a way of coming to the city and to having, have an experience that allows you to interact with Um, the Jesus who was living there, but also the transcendent uh, resurrected Jesus who's uh, spiritually present in the church. So uh, it it is an experience that is understood by Christians sacramentally, but because Christians have 
a diversity of ways of understanding the sacraments, it, there's also many distinctions between the various branches of Christianity about how the pilgrimage experience is to be understood. I know in your work you talked about the history of uh, pilgrimage. So I was wondering if you can tell us when did Christians start uh, you know, making pilgrimages, traveling to Jerusalem? since the uh, you know, beginning of Christianity? Well, one of the first uh, pilgrims to go to Jerusalem was uh, 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 Origen. And he went to Jerusalem because he was studying uh, and writing about uh, the Bible. And he wanted to have an experience of the geography of the places that were mentioned in the Bible as a way of uh, giving some kind of context to what it is that the uh, Bible was saying. And so the, I, I call these exegetical pilgrims, the people who go there to see the land and to understand the Bible as a result of having this personal experience with the land. But that's that early generation and it's the next generation when uh, Christianity uh, becomes uh, authorized and Constantine becomes Christian, that Eusebius of Caesarea, uh, who is the bishop uh, of Caesarea, but also oversees Jerusalem, and Constantine himself decide uh, for theological reasons as well as political reasons to make uh, Jerusalem a center of Christian presence and to create that uh, way of looking at Jerusalem, which we now call the Christian Holy Land. Out of curiosity, if we look at uh, antiquity, who were the pilgrims? Men, women, wealthy, poor, what they were looking for going to Jerusalem? Well, there, I'd like to think of pilgrimage in terms of three different types of pilgrimage. The exegetical pilgrimage, which are those people who go to look at the places where the Bible took place and to become inspired by that, but also to have a greater understanding of it. And frequently, those are people who had a kind of a scholarly interest. Uh, the, another kind of pilgrimage, would have been the what I call the ritualistic pilgrimage. And Roman Catholics tended to pick up on the rit ritualistic pilgrimage as a kind of central feature. And these are the people who go to Jerusalem and want to uh, experience what it is that Jesus experienced in his life and do it by having kind of ritualistic activities in different places where it, that were significant in the life of Jesus. And so the way of the cross becomes one of the ways that this ritualistic pilgrimage takes place. Uh, and as you stop at each one of these stations of the cross, you get a kind of a story about what happened there, a prayer about appropriating that into your own spiritual life. But also the ritualistic pilgrims, the Roman Catholic pilgrims, tended to view it uh, very much in a way of penance. Uh, that is, if you were a sinner and you went to Jerusalem and had this experience, it was a way of atoning for sins. And uh, that just as you would go to confession and get penance, and work that out. So going to Jerusalem was an act of penance, which could uh, alleviate um, the sufferings of purgatory, but could also uh, encourage your faith in such a way that you would be uh, kind of transformed by the experience. And the third type of pilgrimage I tend to identify is what I call the the pilgrimage of touch, the idea that when you go to these holy places, that somehow the activity that has happened there, uh, the incarnation in Bethlehem, or the resurrection in Jerusalem, or the crucifixion on the um, Mount Golgotha, if you can go to those places, if you can touch those places, that there is some kind of sa sacred energy that is implanted there because of what happened, and that you can 
you can access that energy, that spiritual uh, energy that can come into you. And if you are a person of faith, uh, that opens you up to what it is that that uh, spiritual energy can give you. And so the, each of those types of pilgrimage, the exegetical, the ritualistic, and the tactile or the touching type of pilgrimage, um, I think all the all Christians and probably other faiths as well have those experiences. But each type of denomination, the Orthodox, who tend to be tactile, or the Roman Catholics who tend to be ritualistic, or the Protestants who tend to be uh, exegetical, they tend to focus on one of those as the kind of the main one and appreciate the others, but it's that, uh, that one facet of pilgrimage that uh, captures their attention most. Fascinating. So I was wondering in your work, have you come across uh, interesting stories related to perhaps specific pilgrims, uh, whether men or women, who visited the, the city of Jerusalem? Yes, well, um, one of the interesting stories that I saw found in my research was that um, for the Russian pilgrims, they tended to be illiterate and uh, of uh, uh, peasant background, and so not very wealthy. And so the church would help them to create, uh, to, to get their passage to Jerusalem. They would subsidize it. Uh, and these peasants often would take dried up bread and bring it along and dip it in water, and that would become their meal uh, as they worked their way to Jerusalem. But many of them were poor to the extent which getting to the places where the they could catch the ships to Jerusalem uh, was a large journey for them, so that they would uh, travel in what was called hair class. That's H-A-R-E. And hair class was the idea that you could, for very little money, go under the seats in the railroad car and uh, be kind of transported to your uh, to your destination that way. And so this was one of the ways that the uh, the least um, wealthy of these uh, pilgrims were able to kind of slowly make their way to Jerusalem. Once there, there was one story of a woman who so desperately wanted to bring back a statue of the Virgin Mary to her village in Russia, decided to uh, to find a way of um, getting the resources for buying this and convinced the merchant to let her have it uh, while she went out and sat with the statue in the street, begging for the resources to pay for it so she could take it home to her village as a gift from the Holy Land. And so you have this woman sitting, uh, kind of begging for money with the statue next to her. The Protestant pilgrims um, tended to look at the sites like the Holy Sepulchre, uh, where the Orthodox, for the most part, had kind of built shrines to the events there, and felt that in some ways these shrines lost the sense of what the place had looked like in the biblical period. And since they were tended to be exegetical, they wanted to see the site as it would have been. Uh, and so they liked to stand on Mount of Olives because they could say, oh, this is the view that Jesus saw. Or when the garden tomb opened in Jerusalem and they there was a set of tombs that looked like the tombs that Jesus would have been buried in, and they could go into those tombs as opposed to the uh, what had become the Holy Sepulchre, they found that to be much more inspiring. So you, you get this kind of the garden tomb complex becomes something that is created to provide a place for the Protestants to go and feel, oh, this is must have been what it looked like. This is must be what it felt like to be where the tomb of Jesus was at the time of the event itself. You mentioned earlier the Via Dolorosa or the Via Crucis. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims, in fact, millions of pilgrims throughout history, walked through this um, 
pattern of streets throughout Jerusalem, and every now and again they stopped in order to remember um, sort of one of the events described in the Gospels. But to my knowledge, that way of the cross is very much a Franciscan uh, sort of invention. Um, I was wondering how pilgrims react to the reality that that may not actually be the real way of the cross. Does it matter to pilgrims that what they see, what they touch, may not correspond to the real object, the real place that belonged to the time of Jesus? I tend to think it doesn't bother them that much, um, especially the, the, uh, the way of the cross is in many ways uh, a, an, of, an experience that Roman Catholics would have in their own parish church. Right? They would have the stations of the cross in their own parish church, and they would be used to uh, walking through those stations of the cross during Holy Week. And when they get to Jerusalem, what they're doing is the same sort of thing and stopping and recognizing the same sort of events, but at a place which at least in some way, shape or form uh, would have corresponded to uh, the place where it happened. And then, of course, when you get to the Holy Sepulcher, that would be a place where most people would have felt those really were the places where this happened. When you go up to um, the Golgotha and where the crucifixion happened, uh, most people would say, yeah, and that is where it happened. Or when you go to the tomb and you enter into it and you touch the uh, spot of the, where the, the tomb of Jesus was, uh, they would say, yes, that's where it happened. So there would be places along the way that might be a little dubious, places uh, where you stopped, but the, the whole geography of the city had kind of altered over time. But I think the idea of the way of the cross is a whole uh, way of looking at that journey of Jesus uh, ritualistically, which you have in your parish church is being reproduced in Jerusalem. But at the end of it, what you're running into are the actual places where it happened. Fascinating. And this is bringing me to ask you um, a personal question, if I may. You're a scholar, but you're also a man of faith. Have you ever made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem so that you looked at the city with a different uh, pair of eyes? And if you did so, how was your experience from a spiritual and an emotional point of view? I think there were two times where I felt that I was going to Jerusalem as a pilgrim. Uh, and the first one was that first journey. I hadn't been there before. Uh, I had read about it, but I hadn't been there. And so I went explicitly feeling that I was going to do, uh, at least in my own way, what it is that pilgrims do, which was to visit these places and to commune uh, with the spiritual power that they had. Uh, and that was very meaningful to me, although I you know, had to cope with all the concerns that you expressed about the fact that there are issues of legitimacy in terms of the locations. But um, I, that was a, a spiritually enlivening um, journey for me. Uh, the other time was a little harder because it was a a journey that I took there during Easter. And having already written about these pilgrimages uh, being done by various people, uh, now I wanted to go and experience it for myself. And uh, I knew the chaos that would be there when I went to the Holy Fire ceremony in the Holy Sepulchre uh, prior to Easter. I knew it would be chaotic. I knew it would be an event where I had to fight to experience it spiritually and not just as some kind of uh, religious rave event. Uh, and um, it was both. 
uh, it was both chaotic and um, kind of a little scary when the whole place lit, lights up in flame. Uh, on the other hand, I had the experience of all these people over the centuries who had done it, and I realized exactly what it would mean. And in the Russian pilgrims I studied, they would take the flame that had come out of the Holy Sepulchre, they would light their candles, but then they would have these little lamps. And in these lamps would be two candles and they would light these two candles and then close the lamp. And the whole idea was that they would get that flame from the Holy Sepulchre back to their home village. Uh, and although they had to replace the candles along the way, uh, they would be able to say this flame had come from the holy fire. Uh, and that kind of dedication uh, to me was uh, something that I could really appreciate. You mentioned earlier that your first visit was uh, in 1969, if I'm correct. So right after the Six Day War, right? No, that was that was when I saw it from the distance, but didn't get there. The first visit was 1985, when I actually... 1985. Moved. I want to take you a little bit further down memory lane. How was Jerusalem in 1985 when you visited? How did you feel going around the city? Well, this was before the Intifada, and uh, it was a time in which there was a, a, a kind of period of openness mm -hmm between the Israeli authorities who had taken control of the old city in 65, uh, they had slowly started to feel that uh, they could kind of dialogue about this city and appreciate the various communities that found it to be holy. Uh, I think there was a greater diversity of opinion about it at that time, uh, it hadn't broken down into two kind of warring camps. Uh, and so at, initially, there was a lot of openness and a, an ability to kind of talk to scholars on all sides of the uh, question, but also to talk to individual people who tended to visit the two communities, East Jerusalem to the West and West Jerusalem to the East. Uh, it was only later as the Intifada started that that became more and more problematic. You've mentioned that uh, you visited the city essentially every year since you start working on uh, pilgrimage. I was wondering if you can give us a sense of how through your eyes the city has changed. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's changed uh, in a number of different ways. It's, it's changed demographically. Um, the number of Christians uh, living in Jerusalem has been diminished a great, to a great extent. And so that the indigenous Christian population in Jerusalem is shrinking and more and more of the Christian presence in Jerusalem is being imported from outside. Um, there is also uh, a kind of a fractionization, the, uh, at least the people I know best in Jerusalem uh, would feel that many of the uh, secular Jews who had felt most open uh, in Jerusalem uh, have kind of fled to Tel Aviv as they feel that the religious Jewish community is becoming increasingly uh, kind of set in their ways and that uh, Jerusalem isn't as open a city for them as it had been. Um, so all those changes, the Jerusalem quarter when I first went was a, a thriving multi ethnic place. It had predominantly a Jewish population, but it wasn't as uh, rigorously orthodox uh, as it is now. Uh, many people who are, had been secular Jews had built houses there to feel uh, kind of living out their Jewish roots in the city uh, and now have kind of felt that it's become uh, too much of a, well, I hate to use ghetto, but that, that term, it's, it's become an a, a orthodox ghetto where they don't feel comfortable anymore. So many of these people have left. They, they created these wonderful homes with archaeological um, 
digs in the bottom of them that they had sponsored. Uh, and now all these places, many of these places at least are kind of closed to visitors. One last personal question before we're going back to pilgrims. If you were to choose one holy place in Jerusalem that triggers your emotion and your spirituality, which one would be? I, I, I think that the place where I go to pray when I'm in the Holy Sepulchre, and it's, it's a place that's somewhat difficult to pray in because of all the tourists as well as pilgrims who are coming in. I go down to St. Helena's Chapel, uh, which the, uh, the Armenian Orthodox have, uh, and it's down a series of steps, and on the walls going down are carved all these crosses from generations of pilgrims. And when you get down into that St. Helena's Chapel with a dome above it and light coming in, uh, there aren't as many people. And there I feel I can sit on one of the benches that is provided. And for me, that's one of the places where I go to commune with the spirit of the place. I must share uh, my attraction for a specific place in the Holy Sepulchre Church, which is the uh, the back of the Edicula. So where in front you have the Greek Orthodox place where the tomb of Jesus is located, but you also at the back uh, run by the Coptic church, which essentially is, I think, a, a little overlap with, you know, with the, with the tomb. And, and I like it because in general it's a way more quiet and um, it feels more personal. And I understand that I don't even know if it's really connected to the, the tomb itself, but it's in the back and, and, and the fact that there's a less people and I would certainly agree with you, it, it gives you this sense of connection with the place right. instead of the, you know, going into the church and you have this uh, scores of uh, pilgrims and tourists because this is a mixed crowd. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it, it's hard to feel that you're actually visiting a church and a spiritual home uh, rather than probably a touristic place. In yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with the Coptic uh, back end of the, uh, the tomb. There's also one other place which I really love, uh, and that is the prison of Christ. Uh, and uh, one of those chapels along the back end. And that when I first got there, uh, actually after the first intifada, there was an icon that was in that prison um, chapel. And the, the tradition was, and uh, uh, an Orthodox Frida told me about this, that uh, you, you could put a candle through the grate because it was grated off at that point. You could put a candle through the grate and sometimes the Virgin's eyes in this icon would be open and sometimes they would be closed and sometimes they would be crying. And uh, that was supposed to be the Virgin's commentary on what she felt was happening politically in the city, right? Some, when the eyes were open, there was hope. When the eyes were closed, it was not very good. And when she was crying, some horrible event had happened. This is a fascinating story that I didn't know. And uh, uh, I think many don't know, but uh, there's so many of these little stories that really add to the experience of uh, visiting, uh, again, as, either as a tourist, but also as a pilgrim. And I think this adds up to the, to the overall experience. We are going to take a short break. I would like to invite you to join our Facebook page. Click like and follow Jerusalem Unplugged. You can also follow the updates of our podcast on Instagram at Jerusalem Unplugged and on Twitter at Jerusalem Unplugged One. If you have any suggestion about guests, please get in touch and I'll be very happy to interview those who you think are important to unpack the history of Jerusalem and its social fabric. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. Thank you for listening.
So going back to your work on um, pilgrimage and pilgrims, you worked on uh, uh, Protestants and Russian Orthodox pilgrims. I'm curious to understand more about these people, and you already mentioned, you know, why they were going and who were these people. But I'm also interested in understanding how was the pilgrimage organized in, you know, in these communities? What were the places where we're going to visit? And how sort of the whole experience played out from beginning to the end? Well, let's just look at the uh, Protestant, English Protestant pilgrims for a moment, uh, because uh, a number of things happened that all of a sudden brought these Protestants to the Holy Land because Protestantism had tended to look at pilgrimage and uh, especially the penitential pilgrimage of the Catholic Church and felt that that was kind of inappropriate. So for many centuries, the Protestants didn't look to pilgrimage to Jerusalem as something all that significant. But uh, in the 19th century, with the development of the steamship, uh, all of a sudden, the idea that you could travel over there in somewhat some comfort uh, became a big selling point. Uh, and because the upper class British had this tradition of traveling to the classical world and uh, finishing their education with these classical tours, uh, the middle class tended to look at the possibility that they could finish up their kind of cultural um, education by traveling to the lands of the Bible, because it, the Bible was kind of the core text that they had grown up with. Uh, if the upper classes grew up with the uh, classical literature as their core texts, the, uh, the middle class grew up with the Bible as their core text. And so they could go and visit the land of the Bible, uh, and that would be something particularly meaningful to them. The steamship made it technologically possible. Uh, but then because uh, more and more people wanted to go, Cook's tours arose uh, and made it possible for this to become something that was easy to arrange. Uh, and so those people who went on the Cook's tours, who were called by the others cookies, uh, they would be transported to the um, port of Jaffa, and then they would be unloaded because they, they couldn't, the ship couldn't dock, so they had to be unloaded. Uh, uh, and one person talks about being thrown into one of these little boats that came aside like a sack of potatoes. You, you went off the ship and into one of these boats, and then you would be taken to the port of Jaffa. And there the cook tours would set up tents outside, or if you weren't in a cook tour, you'd go to one of the hostels there. Uh, and uh, if you were on a cook tour, then you really had the advantages of all the, your guide and all the expenses were kind of prepaid. And so you just had to follow the program. And that included being taken initially by donkey and other means to Jerusalem, camping out along the way with all sorts of great food being provided for you, including beer that was imported from Britain. Uh, if you weren't, then you had to kind of work out how to hire somebody to be your uh, dragoman, your guide and interpreter for the event and find a way to safely get to Jerusalem because there were bandits along the way. Uh, and so the cookies had a big advantage uh, over these more independent travelers. But if you were coming in as an English Protestant tourist, you would go to Jaffa and then you would make your way to Jerusalem. Uh, and there was there are all these stories by uh, about people making the journey. And when you if anybody who's even driven to Jerusalem from the coast knows that you end up on these hills and you can look down at the city and there's these huge valleys before you get there. And so the first time people were on one of these hills and could see Jerusalem, they said, oh, we're we can see the promised land. We might not be there yet, but we can see the promised land. And so that kind of gave them this encouragement to go on. So the journey to Jerusalem from 
the coast was seen as a kind of a model of the Christian journey in life. So the pilgrimage to Jerusalem was a, a model of the, the Christian's journey through life, the, the pilgrimage like uh, is written about in uh, Bunyan. So that that's basically the early perspective. Once the railroad came in, then you could take a, a half a day and get there on the railroad, but that was different. Um, once you were in Jerusalem, then there were a whole host of places that were expect, it was expected you would visit. Of course, you would uh, go to the Holy Sepulchre and uh, see the, the um, Golgotha, see the rock, uh, the stone of unction, see the tomb, uh, journey to Zion Gate and see the the, the upper room. Uh, you there, you would obviously want to take a journey to Bethlehem to see the place of the nativity, the the cave of the nativity. Uh, you would want to. Um, journey to the Jordan uh, and partake in a ritualistic jumping into the Jordan River as a kind of reaffirmation of your baptismal vows. The Russians, when they got there, uh, had a grand old time because they bought their, um, their shrouds in Jerusalem and brought them with them. These were shrouds that were had a, a picture of the, uh, the, the Jesus being laid in the tomb on them or the crucifixion and they would uh, they're going to be buried in these shrouds but they would take them wave them like flags and jump in the Jordan River uh, as a way of uh, baptizing rebaptizing themselves but also their shroud in preparation for bringing that home and using it uh, in their own burial service uh, then once they come back from the Jordan River, they would journey up to uh, Galilee, Nazareth, the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, and the, the, the place of the Annunciation. Uh, so there was a large um, circuit of places, Mount Tabor to, the, uh, to visit the place of the uh, Transfiguration. So, uh, and of course, for the Protestants especially, the places where Jesus preached because the landscape they felt hadn't really changed, to go to the place where Jesus preached or where he blessed the fish and the loaves, uh, the seaside where he um, partook in a fish meal with his disciples, all these places were particularly meaningful for them. If you were Russian, you were particularly drawn to the place uh, Abraham, where Abraham met the three angels, which was seen as a precursor of the, the Trinity. Uh, and the Russians uh, were particularly fond of that place. And in fact, in the 19th century, bought that holy site so that they could recognize that sig the significance of that. You briefly mentioned something in relation to the question of what pilgrims were bringing back from the Holy Land to their own, own countries. I was wondering if there are any particular objects, materials that they collected and then they journeyed back with that. Well, one of the most popular, and in fact, when I first came to Jerusalem, it was still very popular uh, and maybe as well now, um, though I don't remember seeing a lot of it recently, but that is water from the Jordan River. Uh, these little vials of water were taken back and became a tradition, who knows what kind of bacteria were in there, but it became a tradition that you would add a few drops of this Jordan River oil to the water of any person in your family who is being baptized. Uh, and both the Protestant pilgrims and the Orthodox would bring this holy water back, uh, the water from the River Jerusalem, as, a, uh, as something both for the baptism of their children, but especially, especially in the Orthodox, for uh, marking the, the dead uh, who had been on the pilgrimage.
this is another uh, interesting aspect. As far as I'm aware, there were pilgrims that essentially were traveling to Jerusalem in order to die in, in Jerusalem. Were they buried there? Were these bodies taken back home? What happened to these people? Well, the the uh, Russians had their own cemetery, and they would uh, they would uh, pay for the burial. And in fact, um, actually, there's a parking lot over that now. But uh, originally, that would have been the place where they would do it. And there was a considered to be uh, especially. Um, grace laden if you could die on the pilgrimage because there was so much grace that you had received uh, from this event that if you could die before that all wore off, uh, then there was a good chance that having died in the earthly Jerusalem, you would be quickly resurrected in the heavenly one. Christian pilgrims had to deal with the fact that Jerusalem was inhabited by Jews, Muslims, and other Christians, local Christians who obviously spoke Arabic. How did they negotiate with the fact that the city in the 19th century was run by the Ottomans and inhabited by others? Well, I think many pilgrims, in fact, I would probably say most pilgrims, very much like pilgrims even today, uh, basically ignored that fact. Uh, they came with their fellow believers and they experienced Jerusalem through the eyes of their particular understanding of what Jerusalem was. And they weren't particularly interested in having other people explain their Jerusalem to them. They wanted the Jerusalem that their faith community believed in. And so if you were Orthodox, you found the Orthodox version of Jerusalem. If you were Protestant, you found the Protestant version of Jerusalem. And if you weren't Christian, then uh, whatever way you saw Jerusalem wasn't of great interest to the pilgrims. Uh, for scholars, that's a different story. Scholars, of course, uh, who were in Jerusalem, not just for the sake of pilgrimage, but for the sake of looking at a place where all these religious traditions came together, they had a very different view of the multifaceted nature of Jerusalem. But I think most pilgrims wanted to find the Jerusalem that they came in search of and weren't particularly interested in getting beneath the veneer that they, their own tradition had created. Would it be fair to say that essentially pilgrims imagined their own Jerusalem, which was different from the real city? Yeah, it's it's they had their Jerusalem uh, in their minds before they came. Uh, if you were a Protestant, that's the Jerusalem you had read about in the Bible. You had been taught in Sunday school. If you're Orthodox, it's the Jerusalem that you had seen in the icons that had uh, dis been displayed in the churches you had attended uh, and the ceremonies that you had uh, undergone as a child. Every Orthodox uh, person would have understood that the altar in an Orthodox church is the tomb of Christ. Uh, every church has the tomb of Christ in it. And so when you go and see the tomb of Christ in the Holy Sepulcher, then you're seeing the archetype of all the tombs of Christ you had seen in your own life up to that point. And so uh, that is kind of, they, they came with that perspective of Jerusalem already inculcated. The place where it gets a little more difficult is when you came as a kind of cross between a pilgrim and a tourist. Uh, and many of the orth I mean many of the Protestants did come both as pilgrims but also as tourists. And for them, then they had to really uh, say, okay, as a pilgrim, this is what I'm looking for, but as a tourist, this is what I'm seeing. Now I have to put it together. I was wondering if there were any in current vocabulary we call them VIP pilgrims from either, you know, the Protestant world or from the Orthodox Russian world that visited the Jerusalem in the 19th century. And what was their experience of this pilgrimage? 
Yeah, the uh, the King of Prussia came as a Protestant. Uh, the Tsar comes. Um, it's it, yes, they uh, they are they, but they come predominantly as people who are representing uh, the faith of the population that they represent. And although they may have had uh, political negotiations uh, along the way, uh, they were there because they wanted to take the sacredness of that spot and help legitimate their place in the political and religious hierarchy of their own communities. Uh, so a Protestant uh, king of Prussia wants to be seen as a Protestant and in fact helps build, uh, pay for the Lutheran uh, church in Jerusalem. Uh, the, those royal visitors from the Russian royal family who come uh, sort of want to be their own um, versions of uh, Helena, the mother of Constantine, who had originally come as a pilgrim and had built churches there. Uh, so I think those royal visitors were predominantly coming to represent their own interests and their own communities. There were diplomats who had a slightly different agenda. Uh, they were interested in uh, the power process that was going on. And of course, if you were Russian and or British, the great game was occurring in the 19th century. Everybody was looking for a way of having their nation uh, have the predominance in terms of influence in that area. The Russians were hoping that as uh, Ottoman power shrank, they would be the power that represented orthodox interests. The British wanted to be there because they wanted to protect the, their access to India via the Suez Canal, et cetera, uh, from Russian encroachment. Uh, they were less interested in being completely Protestant because there weren't a lot of indigenous Protestants, but so they took on the role of being the protectors of the Jews as well as the Protestants. So those were the kind of political issues that were playing out um, behind the scenes of the pilgrimage um, visits. One last question. You mentioned earlier the objects that these pilgrims brought back to their own countries. But there's also another aspect about Jerusalem, and that is the image, uh, you know, that you, these pilgrims have acquired spending time in the city itself. What kind of Jerusalem they brought back? What is the memory of these pilgrims that might have been encapsulated into writings or representation or even objects? Essentially, what is the memory of these pilgrimages? In the Middle Ages, the memory would have been in all of these paintings, which you see both in Russian icons, but also in English parish frescoes of these round churches. Uh, the idea being that uh, if you pictured a round church, you frequently were trying to say, and this is the Holy Sepulcher. And the pilgrims had been there. And what do they bring back? Well, some are better artists than others. So they provided a better understanding of what it might have looked like. But a circular church was frequently a way of portraying Jerusalem. And the people who had been there felt that somehow they were, they had grace because they had been there. And in fact, the, the uh, Islamic term haji, pilgrim, uh, and those people who took the hajj and became hajis in Islam are people who are considered kind of elders, significant people whose wisdom you would listen to. And Christians picked up on this. When they came back, they somehow felt that having been there, they were Christian pilgrims. They were hajis. And so uh, they, they were looked upon by their community as kind of being uh, founts of wisdom. And so it, you have these um, memories in paintings, but you also have the memories in terms of the significance it gave the person. In the 19th century, you started to have photography. And then photography became the new way of 
bringing back mementos of what it is you saw. And then of course you could start at having uh, virtual pilgrimages because people started producing books and you could go on your own Holy Land pilgrimage without even getting out of your own chair. Sort of COVID people should understand this, this idea. The very last question, because I was thinking about something while you were mentioning this. What is the future of pilgrimage? Is there a future for a pilgrimage? I think there, the, the desire to be a pilgrim is, is somehow wired into us. Um, almost every religious tradition I can think of uh, values the idea of pilgrimage. And of course, the human experience of being born, living, uh, journeying to some uh, kind of insight about yourself, and finally to death. Uh, life is itself a pilgrimage. And so taking a religious pilgrimage, I think, is too ingrained for it to just kind of disappear. But we're discovering in the modern world, uh, being overwhelmed uh, by tourists uh, can ruin a place. And so what will happen uh, when pilgrims or tourists or one kind of a mixture of those become so overwhelming that what you want to do is escape from it rather than partake in it, uh, that, that's a, going to be a harder question to answer. Perhaps in the post-COVID uh, world, we will discover a Zoom uh, form of pilgrimage. <laughs> Where we sure, yes. don't need to go to a place, but we will just see the place uh, right. through our screen, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and then touch it. <laughs> exactly. Well, but that's certainly part of the pilgrimage, the fact that there's also this need of a physical touch. Uh, and just closing, this reminds me every time going into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you always see these uh, mostly Russian Orthodox touching the stone of the unction, which is really at the very entrance. And, what is amazing is to see this need for the physical touch. And this is really, uh, I guess, part of the pilgrim experience, which is different from the tourist who's just visiting the place itself. Yeah, I can imagine in post COVID, what you get down with and wipe it clean first before you kiss it. Um, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how that's gonna work out, but uh, it'll be interesting to see. Thank you, Thomas. It's been a pleasure having you here as a guest at Jerusalem Unplugged. Uh, I wish you well. And I want to just tell all of the listeners, please, to join us at the, our Facebook page and also Instagram and Twitter accounts. Uh, and get ready for the next episode of Jerusalem Unplugged. Thank you. <laughs>